Thank you very much. So what I want to convey to you here is that language is this incredible human invention. And lots of animals have different systems of communication, but none come anywhere close to human language, just for the sheer scope and complexity and flexibility of the system. We probably started using a proto-language about 1.6 million years ago, um, and it's something that our brains are incredibly well suited to do. Um, and we're also really, really driven to do it. And every single group of humans has come up with language as a system to communicate, uh, and it's invented anew in the mind of every child. So human civilization as we know it is just unthinkable without language. What our human language can do is just astonishing. So it allows us to communicate about things that aren't physically present, things that are distant, things that are in the past, or even things that are in the future. Uh, we can communicate about abstract concepts like justice or beauty or peace. Uh, and we can share ideas without, with people without having to physically demonstrate them. And this means we can accomplish in some incredibly sophisticated planning and coordination with others. And we can pass on a huge amount of knowledge very efficiently to our children and they to theirs. So while language allows individuals to communicate, it also allows for the communication of information over entire civilizations through time. And if you add a written system into this, where you've got a way to communicate thoughts that can exist independently, indefinitely, you've got an immensely powerful and world-changing ability. So when I think of language, in some way, it's kind of like this crazy telepathy system, right? So I can have some incredibly complex thought right, in my head, and I can transmit it into your head. Right? That's weird, right? And I do this by flapping my mouth around, and I move some air, and it goes and hits your ears, and then there's a thought that's appeared in your head. Right? And the thing that's really astonishing about our abilities with language, and especially when we compare to the communication systems of other animals, is the tremendous amount of flexibility that we have. And we can use this system to talk about brand new ideas, things that we've never said before, or things that no one has ever said before, and we can say these new things to somebody else. And like I said, it's something that our brains are really, really good at doing. And almost every child learns language really rapidly and easily without being explicitly taught. And much of the world actually grows up learning two or more languages, and they do this just fine as well. And children are highly driven to learn language. By the age of three, we know a huge amount about our native language, and we have the basis of a really sophisticated system that for a long time we just keep on adding to and adding, becoming more and more fluent and with greater and greater complexity. And it's this ease that actually makes it so deceptive. That language is something that's usually so easy for us, right? And it doesn't require any conscious effort. You think it, you say it. What's the big deal, right? Um, and sure, you can understand that sometimes learning a new language can be painful. Um, but what I want to convey to you today is, like, is that it's actually really hard um, and it's really impressive skill, just our everyday talking ability. And while both speaking and understanding language are both hard, what I'm going to concentrate on today is actually the act of producing language. So how hard is it? During the course of a typical day, you might say about 20,000 words. Um, as university-educated people, you're probably choosing them from a vocabulary of about 80,000 words. We can do this really fast. We can do it at approximately 200 words per minute. And that's a pretty normal rate. That's not auctioneer speak at all. Uh, the words that are in your English vocabulary are made up of about only 40 different phonemes or sounds, and we can speak those really quite easily at a rate of about 11 per second. So using language has sometimes been likened to having a symphony in your head. Right? And you have this huge number of things that need to be coordinated and performed really precisely for it to all happen. And this is one of the big ideas about using language, that we don't just think it and say it. There's an awful lot of different representations and a lot of different pieces of machinery uh, that all need to work together. So just some of the kinds of things that we're needing to coordinate using this system. We need to keep in mind some social aspects of it. Who am I talking to? What am I trying to do in this conversation? I have to have the meaning, the concepts of what I'm saying in mind. 
I have to keep track of the grammatical rules of the system. I have to think about lexical information, about the words that I'm using. The phonological, the sounds of the words, the prosodic information, the tune of the sentences that I'm saying. And then finally, I've got to package this all into some kind of motor program that actually allows my mouth to move and for sounds to come out. So a really big idea here is that language is a kind of translation system. Right? What you do is you start within your head these nonverbal thoughts. Sometimes it feels like we think in language and it's just a process of saying that, but it's really not the case. The thoughts that are in your head are not in a verbal format yet. And what you need to do is transform that into a sequence of words that says the right thing that you want it to say. And from there, you need to change that into a sequence of sounds that can come out your mouth. So as well as being like a symphony with all these parts working together, it's also a lot like a relay race. Um, you've got these different processes working on the little part of it, and they're handing off information to the next process while it starts working on the next part. Or a kind of, you can think of it like a factory production line, where everyone's doing their job and handing it on as quickly as they can. Um, but instead of like a relay or like a production line or even like a symphony, what you're having to do is you're having to change what you're doing every single time. Right? That every sentence you're saying is different from the one that came before. So you're not just able to practice one thing and get very good at it. You've got to reconfigure this system every single time you run it through. And like I said before, we're having to be able to do that really fast. So with all of this stuff happening, it's probably no surprise that errors end up being ubiquitous. We all make them, we make them every day, whether we notice them or not. And this has been one of the most useful ways to start studying language. So let me give you some examples of errors that I have collected from friends and colleagues. Uh, so you can make all kinds of different errors. So like a high level error, you know, I, that's been happening successive nights in a row where I have both of these things. I didn't really need to say them both, but they both get jammed in there for the hell of it. Uh, phrase errors, and say so every time I talk to them on the phone, except it turns out is every time I talk to the phone on them, you can see these phrases have picked up and swapped places with each other. Uh, we also make a lot of word errors. So this one I was trying to say it was like an epiphany, but came out it was like an epitome. And so it's close. It sounds awfully similar, but it's really not quite the right thing. Sometimes we refer to those as malapropisms. Uh, a colleague talking about psychology was trying to describe the process of object and scene perception, but of course it came out as obscene perception. Uh, other kinds of word errors we can make. So trying to say kick the sheets off the bed, but kick the beds off the sheet. Again, these things change over. This one was a colleague of mine who was trying to reinforce her toddler daughter for going successfully to the potty and simultaneously tried to say, hooray and terrific, but it came out yelling at her, horrific. <laughs> one that I've studied a lot has been the tip of the tongue state, where you have this agonizing state, you're trying to think of a word, you almost have it there, you know that you have it, you just can't quite get it out. It happens with names a lot of the time, and sometimes you know a few of the sounds of it. So you might know, like, oh, it's a V name, it's like Vanessa, Victoria, you might know how many syllables it has or something. Sometimes you can think of a similar word, um, but often you know it's the wrong one. If someone tells you, you know, is it this? No, no, that's not, it's just not coming to me, right? Um, Another one that happens all the time, children throughout the ages have been mortally aggrieved by being called by their sibling's name, or you know, worse, the dog's name. Um, then you can become a parent and realize you're doing the same thing to your children as well. Uh, we make morpheme errors, so the, these are parts of the words that are meaningful. So this is one, this was me, this is, I was trying to say this bar is overrun by undergrads, um, but it came out, this bar is underrun by overgrads. Uh, this is another one, this is me as well. This great product on TV, I was seeing a calcium rust and lime dissolver, but I kept talking about a calcium lust and rhyme dissolver. Right, so clearly these sounds, these phonemes, have picked up and swapped places. And of course, you know, you all being good McMaster people would be familiar with the classic. Right, so these last ones especially, 
um, are probably the most well-known. They're sometimes known as Spoonerisms, so named after the Reverend William Spooner, who was the Dean and Warden of New College at Oxford. And he was infamous for making these kinds of slips and things were trying to you know, raise a toast to the dear old queen, but instead raised a toast to the queer old dean. <laughs> um, and there's a ton of them that are attributed to him. The sad truth of the story is he probably made most of them up. And the ones that he didn't make up, his students made up and attributed to him as well. But we still do refer to them as spoonerisms pretty often. So what's causing these? Um, so one really popular idea had been that of Freud, right? That these are also referred to as Freudian slips sometimes. And so he was arguing that it's these suppressed or repressed thoughts and desires um, that inadvertently come out in the slips, right? And they're letting your innermost thoughts out, even the ones that you don't acknowledge to yourself, right? And this idea has been really popular. And if I give you, you know, examples like the lust dissolver and, you know, the mother yelling out horrific to her daughter, you can kind of see where he's going with this, right? Um, but there's a huge problem with the selectivity that he was doing coming up with these theories, right? Um, it makes a lot of sense. You know, the ones that you report and you talk about are obviously the ones that are funny or naughty, and you don't have a very good sense of, you know, what are the ones that people actually do make? How are these things actually formed? Um, so even from a psycholinguistic viewpoint, there's a problem when we look at these errors that are out in the wild, right? The ones that you report on, you can go and analyze them people tend to report on the ones that are amusing in some way. So we don't know what's, you know, the real scope of what's going on there. Right. Um, however, when we analyze the kinds of errors that we do make, Freud was certainly right about one thing, that speech errors don't happen randomly, right? Even though they're this erroneous behavior, they have all of these regularities. So one thing we know is that word errors tend to obey word rules. They care about things like nouns swap with nouns and verbs swap with verbs. Uh, the outcomes tend to be grammatically legal even if they don't make sense. Uh, sound errors tend to obey sound rules. So the beginnings of words exchange with the beginnings of words. Uh, the outcomes tend to be phonologically legal. And so one thing we see is that words split apart at really predictable places. And when you can see where it splits apart when it goes wrong, that's telling us that these are some of the building blocks of language, right, that we're using to build it up. And whether it's you're building sentences out of words or if you're building words out of sounds. So these errors have been a really useful way to start the scientific study of how we produce language. And their errors reveal things like the building blocks of language. And they also talk about the rules that we use to put these together. Uh, so by these give us an insight into what's normally a really seamless process. And by seeing where the system breaks down, we can start to figure out how it was built together in the first place. So like I said, there's a bit of a problem in just looking at the errors that people tell you about or people tell you that their professors said in the email. They do email me. If you care to email me with good ones you have, I would be delighted to hear them. From like, you know, you can email me in five years' time. Here's one that I came across. I'll be really, truly delighted. Um, so that it can be a lot better to start looking at errors in the lab. Right? And this way we don't have selectivity problems, right? This way we're able to actually elicit errors, get people into the lab and get them to make errors on the spot. And we can do this under controlled conditions where we can record them and listen back to them and really figure out what's going wrong. And luckily we figured out a bunch of ways of doing that. And we have a whole bunch of techniques that we can use to elicit grammatical errors, or word errors or morpheme errors or phonological errors. And today I'm going to especially talk about two types of these, uh, the tip of the tongue errors and also the spoonerism type phonological errors. So how do we get people to make errors, right? Well, there are some really time-honored ways. We can do tongue twisters, right? The child's game, they're actually pretty useful. So here's where you get to feeling limbo to have a go at some of these, right? So here's one, a bucket of blue bug's blood, a bucket of blue bug's blood, all right? So what you're going to do now is have a go at it. I'm going to clap in time, you know, a bucket of blue bug's blood. Um, okay, ready? A bucket of... Keep up, 
Okay, how'd you do? Anybody make mistakes? Yes. <laughs> okay, that's a pretty easy one, actually. We have much harder ones than that for you. Here's one that's much harder. The six sixth sheep sixth sheep sick. The six sixth sheep sixth sheep sick. It's actually a lot easier when you read it. If you're having to do it from memory, it's much harder. Okay, here we're gonna go. The six sixth sheep sixth sheep sick. The six. All right, ready? The six. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wipe yourselves down. <laughs> okay. Um, so here's another one that uh, Stephanie Shattuck Huffnagel recently she decided that this next one's probably the hardest one in English. Pad kid poured curd pulled cod. Pad kid poured curd pulled cod. Okay. Ready? Pad, Pad kid. kid poured curd pulled cod. <laughs> How, how'd you go? Mistakes? Yes. Okay, so here's a question. Why are these hard? What's so difficult about these? You might say, but I mean, you're having to say them so fast, your tongue can't move that fast, right? You know, a bucket of blue bug's blood, a bucket, you know, I went to the store and bought some milk, right? It's not actually very fast that we're saying these things. So it's not the speed of it, right? We say, well, maybe a bunch of the sounds are really similar that you're saying sh and sh and k, right? And your tongue can't move between all of those very readily. So let's try this one, right? So what you're gonna do, rubber baby buggy bumpers, rubber baby buggy bumpers, rubber baby buggy bumpers, right? Except what you're gonna do is not say it out loud. You're gonna say it in your head, right? Say it in your head so you can kind of hear the inner voice do it and listen to what you do, okay? So we're gonna go rubber baby buggy bumpers, but silently, ready? Okay, did anyone make any mistakes inside their head? No. Yes. yes. <laughs> when you do these, you can try them on some of the other ones if, you know, maybe you're super good at rubber buggy bumpers, but, you know, you can try some of these ones. And what you find is that people don't make quite as many mistakes, but they still make mistakes even when it's inside your head, right? Your tongue isn't having to do anything, right? So tongue twisters don't actually have anything to do with your tongue, right? Tongue twisters are happening inside your head. Right? And it has to do with the normal process of having to plan and select, plan and execute these strings of sounds and get these sequences just right in the correct order and so quickly. So we have some other ways of eliciting errors in the lab. So here's one, the slips procedure. So it experimentally elicits these spoonerisms. Um, so what you're going to do so I'm going to flash a pair of words up at you, and you just read it to yourself silently. Right? I'm going to flash them, and then another one, and then another one. Every now and then, you're going to get a cue to speak, right? where you're going to get these exclamation points. And when you see those, you have to repeat out loud the pair that you saw, the last pair that you saw, as quickly as you possibly can. Okay? Um, and so there's a deadline. You're not really going to be able to hear the beep, but there's a very annoying eep sound that you've got to beat this beep to get it out. Okay, everyone know what we're doing? Okay, here we go. Okay, did anyone make any mistakes? A, a few of them, okay. So you can see what we're doing there on these critical trials especially, we're setting you up. We give you a pattern, so a ba, da, ba, da, ba, da, and then we switch it up and we give you a da, ba, then make you speak. This is actually much slower than we present it to the poor undergraduates in the lab. <laughs> um, they have to do it much quicker than you're doing it. Um, and, and so reasonably often, you manage to get people and they'll make that mistake there. Right? So that's some of the techniques we have to do these phonological errors. Um, I also like to torture people by eliciting tip of the tongue states from them. Uh, that th remember that these are the times when you can't quite remember the word, that you know that you know it, but you don't quite have it there. You'll know it if you hear it, but you, it's just kind of agonizingly out of reach. 
Right? So what we do is we present people with definitions of fairly rare words um, and get them to report whether they know it, they don't know it, or they're in a tip of the tongue state. Right? So try these. What's the name? Don't yell it out if you know it. What's the name of the shiny, usually black volcanic glass formed by the rapid cooling of lava? The answer is obsidian. <laughs> okay. What do you call people who explore caves? Spelunkers, right? Okay. What's the name for the body's principal air passage, the medical name for windpipe? Ah, oh, you have to be quiet and let other people stew in their agony. Okay. Oops. Oh, I gave you the way the answer. <laughs> Shamrock. It was just in Patrick's Day. You probably were all primed up on that one. Okay. What do you call it when a legislator gives long speeches in an effort to delay or obstruct legislation that he or she opposes? I see there's a few people in the characteristic pose of the tip of the tongue state. Ready? Filibuster. Okay. Right. One more for you. What's the name of the sacred dung beetle of ancient Egypt? Scarab. <laughs> Scarab, exactly. Okay. So did anybody make it, get into any tip of the tongue states yeah. on those ones? A few of them. So we certainly can't get you to do it every single time. We've got to give you these pretty rare words that some of the time you're going to know it, some of the time you're going to just, I have no idea what that word is, right? And every now and then we hit the sweet spot and people get in and report a tip of the tongue state. Okay, and so if you were in a tip of the tongue state, did anyone have the experience where like you knew a few of the sounds, or, like you had a feeling about what it started with, maybe it starts with an F or something like that? Okay, but, so what does all this mean, right? What has this told us about the way language production works? Right, so I told you before that it's like this relay um, where you have to turn this nonverbal thought into words and then into sounds. So these TOTs have taught us a huge amount about how we do that process. Right? What there really are is this case where you get stuck halfway through that process. So we think about this in terms of a two-stage model of language production. Right? So up at the top, you have a conceptual level. So if you can't, there's a dog and a cat and a rat there. These are things you're thinking of them. It's not the words for these. These are your ideas about these things. From there, we map them onto the word level. We call it a lemma level. So it's a word, but it's not really a full word. It's kind of more like the abstract form of a word um, where it doesn't have any sounds yet, but it has, it's a pointer to that specific word, and it has the grammatical information associated with it. And from there, you can map that on and map it on to the correct phonemes for each of those words. So if things are going well, I'm trying to say cat, I would activate that. It would send activation on down to the lemma level. It would send its activation on down to the phonological level. And you would say cat, right? No problems. Right. People don't meant to tend to make, see, there I did it. People don't tend to make very many tip of the tongue states on words like cat. So let's go back to our spelunker one. OK, so we start up at the conceptual level. I have an idea of a spelunker. I map it onto the lemma level. Ideally, I should be able to map that onto the phonological level as well. The problem with the tip of the tongue state is that something's gone wrong during that last stage. I've made that first step just fine. I have the word. I know it. This is what's driving me crazy. It's those sounds that I'm not able to get out. Or sometimes I might even have some partial information. I know it starts with a s. It's an S word, but I don't have the rest of it. So a little bit of information has gone down, but not enough to get you all of the way there. Right. So one important thing to take away from these TOTs is that so much stuff has actually gone right when you're doing it. They're incredibly frustrating. Right? We know that as we get older, they become more and more common. Right? And this drives people insane. They think that they're losing it. It's actually not all bad news. One reason that we think that older people have more of these than younger people is that older people just have larger vocabularies to some extent, right? And so when you're in a tip of the, so a younger person, for example, might just be, I don't know, 
right? Doesn't, doesn't worry them, I don't know that word, right? If you're older, you have a larger vocabulary, you might actually know this word, and you're in a tip of the tongue state, so it feels much, much worse to be in it, because you're almost there, it's much more annoying. But it's actually a situation of a lot more information than if you just plain old don't know the word. So this explains these tip of the tongue errors. How do we explain these uh, phonological exchange errors? So something like if you're trying to say coin toss, but it turns out to be toin cos instead. Right? Um, so before we saw a model of how you go from a thought to a word, um, but there's a few bunch of complications that we have to deal with as well. Most of the time we're speaking, it's not just one word that we need to pick, it's several words. Right? And then we have to get them in the right order. So if I'm trying to say coin toss, I have my conceptual level here, I should map on to the lemmas, and then I should map that on to the phonemes. And what I have to do is do these in the right order as well. I need to do coin first, and only then should I move on to toss. Right? However, if I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, I'm going to have some problems. If I'm thinking about toss already, and I've got a little bit of activation there, and it's sent on down a little bit of activation to its lemma, it's sent on a little bit of activation to the phonology, I have this little bit of advanced stuff going on, where I've gotten ahead of myself, and maybe that T sound is going to sneak in earlier than it's meant to be. So I end up saying toin cos in the end. So these kinds of things are a problem of planning, where you've gotten Something that, that you're trying to do a little bit ahead has gotten a little bit too active too early. Right. So this all seems to make sense, right? Um, now remember we talked about those errors, like if you're making a word error, it obeys word rules, and if you're making a sound error, it obeys sound rules. That's largely true, but sometimes there's a bit of leakage between levels. Okay? So try this one, right? Say out loud with me, poke, 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 poke. What's the white part of an egg called? Really, the yolk? It's the white, right? It's very compelling. So I got you to make a word error by changing the sounds that were in your head. So I've got this leakage of information. The sounds are influencing your choice of the words. And we know that there are other cases of that as well. Right? So for example, even those sound errors, the spoonerisms, they're a lot more likely to happen if they turn into a real word. So they're kind of caring about some word type of things. Um, you're also much more likely to get called by the wrong sibling name if the siblings have similar sounding words as well. It makes that selection process much more difficult. So there's generally these stages of processing, but there's also a little bit of wash of information going back between them. So are errors bad, right? Um, what I want to say is no, right? I've tricked you into making a bunch of errors. Um, you're not alone, and I can trick you into making these because I'm really good at it, right? And this, I've been practicing this for quite some time. Um, quite a lot of the time, we don't even notice ourselves, um, unless you're unlucky enough to have a psycholinguist following you around and writing down the things that you're saying. Um, so what I want to argue to you is that making mistakes is the price that we pay for the fluency and flexibility of the system. Right? So it's a good thing to be thinking ahead of what you want to say down the road. That's going to make you much faster. Just every now and then, you're going to get your timing a little bit wrong and get a little bit ahead of yourself. And that's what's going to end up making, having you an error. Um, it would be really easy if we just had to say the same thing all the time. We'd practice it, we'd get super good at it, but that's near, clearly not what we do. We have this flexibility, and the ability to say different things, um, and we're always sort of pushing the edge of our fluency, that we're always you know, thinking ahead, speaking as quickly as we can, not always as quickly as we can, but we're really you know, flying by the seat of our pants most of the time, that we're waiting for this next word to come, and most of the time it comes, and we go on, and everything's great. Every now and then there's a little glitch in the system. But getting ahead of ourselves is really just the price of fluency. Right? However, there is one problem um, that we've been researching in our lab a fair bit, a problem with errors. The idea is that some errors tend to repeat. So you've noticed that people sometimes get into a tip of the tongue state on the same word 
over and over again, right? even if you've been told the answer to it. Right? So does anyone remember the name of the parliamentary procedure? That Did anyone have a moment of, oh, I've forgotten it again? Not this time, I could probably get you later. Um, right? So when you're told the answer, right, this feels really counterintuitive. How could I possibly forget this thing again? Right? It was a word that I knew. You gave me the answer. It makes such perfect sense now. How could I forget that again? It was so annoying when I couldn't remember it. And it's such a feeling of relief when you actually do get it. Um, but what we find is that people do make a mistake on that same word again. Right? So if this really does happen, why might this be happening? There are kind of two possibilities. And the first one has to be true, that some words are just idiosyncratically hard. Right? This word, I can never remember this word. So it was hard for me once. It's going to be hard for me the next time. Right? Not too surprising. What I want to argue for is that these tip of the tongue states can also be learned. Right? So to think about it this way, the TOT is that incorrect mapping of the representations, right? going down a certain pathway between the word and the phonology. And every time you go down a pathway, it strengthens that. So if you've gone down the wrong pathway, the one that isn't getting you to the right word, and you keep on trying to think about it, you're essentially strengthening that pathway and digging yourself in. I like to think of this like you're stuck in the snow with your car and you know, you're not going anywhere. You just keep on spinning the wheels and you're not getting yourself anywhere closer to where you want to go. You're just digging yourself in deeper and deeper. And so the next time you go to do it, you're going to have that great big rut to, go in, to fall into. So how do we test this? So basically, what we do is we bring people into the lab, we elicit tip of the tongue states on them, and then we retest them at a later point. And we can measure the reoccurrence rate they're doing this at. So an experiment would look like this. We give them a definition. They have to respond if they know it, they don't know it, or they're in a tip of the tongue state. Um, in some of the experiments, we institute this delay where sometimes you have to think about it for 10 seconds before we tell you the answer. Sometimes you have to think about it for a full 30 seconds of agony before we tell you the answer. And the idea is that this is what's going to really spin your wheels deeper and deeper. The more time you spend digging yourself in, the worse it's going to be. Then we give you the answer, spelunker, is this the word you're thinking of? And we'd bring you back for a test, say, 48 hours later, and we give people the same definition. Um, and they respond whether they know it, they don't know it, or in a tip of the tongue state, and we check that this is the answer that they were looking for. So two main hypotheses here. Number one, errors should repeat. If there's a word that you're in a tip of the tongue the first time, you should be more likely to make a tip of the tongue on that word the second time. The second part of this is the longer you spent in the tip of the tongue that first time, the more likely it should be to reoccur the second time. So the results from an experiment with Amy Warner uh, looking at, this is the probability of getting a, a TOT on test two given your particular response on day one. Essentially, this is the error repetition effect. If you're in a tip of the tongue the first time, you're a lot more likely for it to happen again the second time than if you either knew it or you didn't know it. And then furthermore, we also see this delay effect where you're more likely the longer you were to spend in that. Um, in some subsequent experiments, we've sort of clarified some of this delay effect that it really matters that you're thinking hard about that word. If you're just kind of spacing out and not really thinking about it hard, it doesn't have such an effect. Um, you have to really work hard to dig yourself in, in these long tip of the tongue states. So uh, Maria D'Angelo and I had a bunch of extra questions. We wanted to know what the time course of this was. We also know that sometimes speakers are able to come up with a word. They were in a tip of the tongue state, and they keep thinking about it, and then all of a sudden it comes to them. So what happens when you're able to do that? Um, and then finally, is there anything we can do to get out of this? Right? Are you doomed, or can we actually ameliorate this effect? So first, what happens when you resolve it? Uh, so basically running the same experiment again, what you see um, is that you have this Error repetition effect, you're much more likely to make a tip of the tongue the second time if you're in it the first time. Then furthermore, it makes a big difference if you resolved it 
you're okay the next time. You make some errors, but you're largely protected. If you didn't manage to resolve it yourself the first time, you're pretty likely to make a mi mistake on it the second time. Okay. We said, okay, well, this is 48 hours later. How long does the effect last for? So we brought people back in a whole week later after they did their first test to see if we still saw this repetition effect. Yes, a whole week later, they're still making mistakes on these same words. So this is pretty strong. Um, if it's, you know, the effect is strong enough to last a whole week, what would happen if we retested people immediately? Right? So what we do is you've gone through the experiment. After each trial, we verify, is this the word you were thinking of? They're given the correct answer. Um, and then we just turn around and say, guess what? We're going to test you again on these things. And we just run them through a second time, give them these same things that they saw, some of them just five minutes before, and they make mistakes on the words again after immediate test. It's extremely annoying to know that you remember that you just forgot this one and that you were told the answer and that you knew the answer, but people still tend to forget it again. We were pretty surprised by this. We thought, well, how strong is this thing, right? What if we tell people, right? I'm going to test you again on these words immediately, right? Pay attention. I'm going to give you the answers. I'm going to test you again, right? Yes, they still make mistakes on the same words, even when they've been warned that they're going to be retested. It's starting to get very, very annoying at this stage. Right. So one thing we know, right, that resolving it yourself protects you a great deal from future error. Um, just telling people the right answer, because they have been getting the right answer, just telling them doesn't seem to help. Right. So, that's very interesting from a psycholinguistic point of view. From a practical point of view, you know, what should my advice to you be? Don't make a mistake. Right? If you're going to make a mistake, make sure you solve it. Right? How, how are you going to implement this? Right? So we're wondering, what happens? Could we actually help people to resolve it? Can we give them a little bit of a push along right? and let them resolve it by the a hint that we're able to give them? Would that help them out when we come to test them again? So in this case, we used a queued resolution. So we're doing it 48 hours later. We actually did the same one a week later as well. The results are the same. Um, after they answered, they're in a tip of the tongue state or a don't know, we would either give them a phonological cue. So we'd say it starts with sp, right? Or we'd give them no cue at all. Or we'd just tell them the immediate answer. They don't have to think about it for a long time. We say it's spelunko, right? And then we come back and we test them later. So the first thing we find is that our cues help a lot. Right? If we don't give them any cues, they solve it on their own about 35% of the time. When we give them this phonological cue, it jumps way up to about 82%. We found out later um, in experiments with Bowie Ho in my lab at the moment, it helps even better if you give the whole first syllable, it seems. Okay. So then the results are as follows. Here are the important bits. So overall, we do see this error repetition effect, that errors are still repeating. You're more likely to make a tip of the tongue the second time if you did it the first time. Here's the immediate answer one. If we give you an immediate answer, it doesn't protect you. Right? We think that that should be low, that you should know it the next time. Giving you the immediate answer doesn't protect you. You still make that error again the next time. But these are the ones where we helped you out. Right? We gave you a cue that you're able to resolve it. You probably wouldn't have gotten it on your own. But now this is really helping you. Right? We can cheat you along. Right? It starts with sp oh, spelunker, and then you're not going to make that mistake again if we give you enough of a help. But you still have to kind of go that final extra little bit yourself. And that's what seems to cement it in your head. Some subsequent work we've been doing, wondering, is it really this phonological mapping stage that's going wrong with these? Uh, so with John Harley, an honor student at the moment, we're wondering, what happens if we give people slightly different definitions on test and retest? Right? So a different memory cue, maybe that would help you to get out of it. Um, if you think it's just the phonology that's doing it, that probably wouldn't help. If you think that there's something, you're just getting hung up on this definition, oh, that's the one I can't remember, whatever, maybe a different cue should help you to be able to do this. So we're asking, do the errors repeat when you give them a different, slightly different definition, pointing to the same word, but a different way of getting to it? 
Turns out the errors still repeat. It doesn't help you any better to know it when we give you this different memory cue the next time. Right. Another honors student in my lab at the moment, Tim Lee, uh, looking at this, the same process, but looking at it with faces. Instead of these definition of words, we give people faces and get them to try and name who it is or tell us if they're in a tip of the tongue state on it. Okay, so for example, and we use famous actors for these. If you know them, don't yell them out. Okay. Okay, any tip of the tongues? Do you need me to help you out? This one? Kirsten Dunst? <laughs> the, the, that's the sound of the, the TOT. That's exactly it. Sometimes there's cursing involved as well. Um, okay, so the other thing that we can do with these is, again, we can give kind of different definitions for these, right? Is the problem specific to this particular cue? Is it specific to this stimulus? Or do they repeat whatever it is, just it's that last phonological step to the name that's the problem? So for this one, we might either give you a face or we could give you a description. She starred as Elizabeth Swan in the Pirates of the Caribbean, Elizabeth Bennet in Pride and Prejudice, and Anna Karenina in Anna Karenina. And we do this where they either see a face, and then they see the same face the next time, or we mix it up, they see a face, then a definition, or vice versa. So the first thing we find, same results. TOTs repeat for faces just the same way that they do for these definitions. Um, and the definitions of the regular words. And giving you a different definition doesn't really help to get you out of the learned TOT. It doesn't bring you into knowing it any better. So, in summary, tip of the tongue states repeat. Uh, they repeat 48 hours later. They repeat a week later. They repeat on immediate retest. They repeat even when you're aware of an upcoming retest. Um, it happens on both words and faces, and it happens even when you give people different cues for it. Um, we know that resolving it helps prevent the error reoccurrence, and that happens that's better than just being told the answer. However, if we help you to resolve it, if we cheat you towards that resolution, that will help as well, right? and that might be pretty useful. There's one other line of research that we've been pursuing in my lab, some other bad news, um, that we've done that slips procedure where we give you the, the words and you have to repeat them before the EEP sounds. So we elicit these phonological errors and then we retest you on the same ones a little while later. And we find that you learn those slips as well, that making it once um, is going to make you over four times as likely to make that same slip of the tongue again the next time you encounter those words. So overall from this, we see that every act of speaking is an act of learning, right? That even as an adult, you're very good speakers. You're not, don't feel like I'm learning language anymore. Every time you use the system, you're learning a little bit more. You're fine-tuning the system. Most of the time, that's a really good thing, right? Fine-tuning is good. It's helpful. It gets you more fluent. It gets you faster. This is practice, right? The downside of it is that even erroneous states are able to be learned. Um, but you know, before you get too depressed about all of this, remember, you do do an awful lot of correct practice as well. And that's probably going to see you through. Making a mistake once, you're not probably going to be doomed forever. Um, although I know that Judy Shedden is incapable of saying coin toss, I believe. I think she says, is this correct? Toin toss? I'm incapable of saying So, you know, despite the quirks of the system, Producing language is this incredible feat. Right? Um, it's a feat of speed, it's a feat of flexibility, and of sheer creativity. Our brains are fantastic at it, and they're constantly learning and adapting to be able to improve and adapt to whatever it is that we're doing. Um, errors are a ubiquitous part of normal language use. 
Um, and even if they're annoying from time to time, they do give us this invaluable window into the process. So we've been able to learn about how we're able to do this thing. And they're the downside of this amazing, flexible system that we have. Thank you.